Thank you all very much and, and, um, and welcome to the workshop today. And I was invited to come here and help talk about design thinking, how it works and what it means in terms of pediatric healthcare. But what I wanted to start us thinking about first are the conditions of healthcare right now in the world. And I'm very impressed by Finland and, and Helsinki. Uh, I'm American and I live in Shanghai. I'm working in Melbourne and now I'm in Finland. So I'm trying to keep track of what time it is. Uh, it's hard for me. But um, again, today's all about being here in Finland, so hey. Um, the idea here is we're looking at um, design. We're looking at ways to approach healthcare through a designer's lens. And my name is Gregory, and I'm a designer. Uh, and some of you here are designers as well. But I'm not a doctor. And um, I work at a company called IDEO. Oops, sorry. I messed up my slide already. I work at a company called IDEO. How many people have heard of IDEO? Okay. IDEO is a 30-year-old design and innovation consultancy. We're based out of the Bay Area in San Francisco, but we have 11 offices all around the world, and I'm lucky and feel privileged to work in the one in Shanghai. And we started off doing products, making things. We actually were working on the first, uh, we designed the first Apple mouse, and uh, our founder, Bill Mulgridge, was uh, known for actually inventing, if anybody's ever used a laptop, uh, that was his idea. <laughs> so the clamshell form of computer is something he developed. And over the years, we did things around service, around experience, around things beyond just products, because as we learn, products are, are things, but the experience around products is super important. We figured we need to get into this and understand it better. So over the last 30 years, that's what we've done. Um, part of my, my role at IDEO is to be a communications designer. And that means, and some of you here may be communications designers as well, to express and articulate the value of things, right? And that's really hard to do when there's so many things. So how do you actually articulate value? That's what we're going to try to do today in terms of what is quality health care for children and what can we do as people, not just designers, to make it even better. So I'm not a doctor. I'm not a health care professional. I'm not an expert, right? But I've been a patient, and I'm pretty sure you all have too. Like every single person in here has been a patient in a hospital. I mean, you had to, well, unless you've been born in a hut somewhere before and never ever set foot. In a, if you're born in a sauna, then fine. But we're all patients and we all have things that we have stories about. And what I'd like to ask everybody here, especially audience members, when you think of hospital, when you think of your experience in hospital, what is, how does that make you feel? What do you think about? And we'll talk more about that in a bit when we get into the workshop. But what I think is really important about Finland, what I think is very interesting is, I saw this sign, it's actually painted on the ground, right? And I'm sure everybody here is used to seeing this, but it inspired me because I see this actually in a lot of places. Finland takes care of its children, and it's, it, it says so right in the sign. I think it's very, very important to recognize that this is a country that really respects and cares about kids, even when it comes to signage on the road. And it's a very good place to be. So what I want to talk to you right now about are the conditions of healthcare. And when I say conditions, you know, I come from America and I live in China and I'm working in Australia and I come to Finland and I see different conditions of healthcare at a very, you know, large level, at a big scale. So what are the factors? And this is something I've been thinking about a lot. There's cost, right? Things are very expensive. Um, healthcare for some countries are more expensive than others. And for other countries, doctors are not paid well. There's on both sides, patient and healthcare. There's access. How many people in a country actually have good access to care? How many doctors can they, can they see near them, especially if they live in the country or someplace where it's remote, right? Expertise. How good are the doctors? How good are the nurses in this country or in the place? And then the experience overall. What are the physical and the emotional feelings, the, the emotional experiences that make Healthcare, a positive experience for people. And those are the four factors that I think actually apply. And very recently, um, Bloomberg did a study um, compiling information from uh, different sources. We've got the World Bank and, and the, the World Health Organization. They rank the top 50 most efficient healthcare systems in the world. Uh, well, it's not no big secret, but I won't give it away. Number one, I will give it away. Number one is Hong Kong. So, but it's ironic because. Um, 
China's in the list as well, but I'll get to that in a second. I'm from America. There are 300 million people in America. And right now it's ranked number 46 on the list of top 50 in the world. So people are expected to live up to 78 years. That 17% of our gross domestic product is actually spent on healthcare, which means that on average, we spend about $8,000 per capita per person with results that aren't exactly the best. And it wouldn't you know, surprise anybody that people in America think healthcare needs to get better. So with these factors, it's expensive. Insurance and all kinds of things dictate how you can get access to care. But people do have pretty good access. It's not like we have you know, people in very, very rural places that don't have access to a doctor. It's fairly reasonable. Medical practitioners in America are very good. We have some of the best universities and we attract the best talent in the world. So it's a good condition to have. We're actually in good shape. Experience, it's good. Relatively speaking, in the world, it's pretty good. Now, what I found was interesting, the reason I brought up Hong Kong as number one, where I live in China, we have 1.3 billion people, right? So the scale is, is enormous. They rank 37, more uh, efficient than the United States which if you think of China and you think of what that means, well, there's lots of factors that go into that. We have old people as well, the people that live up to 73. 4.6% um, of the GDP is spent on healthcare. Sounds like a low number, and I don't know what you're thinking, but a low number may not be great because you're only spending $278 per person compared to that 8,000 for the United States. So the cost is negligible. People don't have to pay too much. Um, but the problem is people don't all have access. And the other problem with cost and access, doctors don't get paid very much in China. In fact, I read a story the other day, one surgeon was saying he makes about $600 a month. A lot of bribes go back and forth to try to get people to work and do their case. People come with what they call hongbao, a red envelope full of money to bribe doctors, please do the surgery for my child. I, I don't have enough money. He doesn't have enough money as a surgeon, so he'll take it, and that's what happens. So the care, uh, the, the professionalism, the, the expertise of doctors is not great, and it could get better. By extension, the experience also could get better. Let's go to Finland, though. Finland, you have five million people. That's about the size of Singapore, where I've also lived. Um, and my city in Shanghai is 23 million, so it's kind of just my town. There's about four of yours there. Um, but Finland ranks number 23 on the list of the top 50 most efficient healthcare systems. And you have old, old people here, 80s, which is great. Uh, that means people are healthy and, and surviving longer. And you spend about 10%, which seems like a pretty good number uh, on healthcare here. And you spend about $4,000 per person. I think that's, it seems very reasonable to me. You've got it all covered. I mean, everything here seems pretty good. You've got great access to care. You have really good doctors. You have Everybody can get to a doctor. The experience is where we need to think about improving. The reason why we're here today is because we're looking at what, what uh, Petco was showing with the, the hospital. There are experiences that we can improve because we have access to so many things here that are very good, but now we can think about experience. So today we're here to spark new ideas, new directions. This is only one day of a, of a workshop and in one day, you're not going to solve everything. And I want to be very clear about that. Don't feel pressured that if it doesn't come out that we have the, the, the silver bullet idea for the next children's hospital in six hours, that it, that it didn't work. But this is the start and a spark for more conversations, OK? We're going to look at this through a design lens. And when I say design lens, I mean it's not just about architecture. And it's not just about furniture. It's also about processes, systems, things that are brought together to solve a problem. And it used to be when I, I, I'm more of a graphic designer, right, an interaction designer. I used to talk about design as being art with purpose, right? You think about all the things you're seeing here, what's the purpose behind those things? Design solves problems. And design thinking is a method to walk through those problems. So we're gonna use design thinking as a way to help us identify human needs, identify what could be viable as business, identify what could be possible from technology standpoint. So what is design thinking? Uh, it's a big question. And this is the way uh, my boss, Tim uh, Brown, actually <laughs> talks about design thinking when he wrote it in his book. Um, but design thinking is a human-centered approach. 
know, it's a human-centered approach to problems and innovation that draws from a designer's toolkit, which I'll talk about in a second, to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements of business success. So the designer's toolkit part is very important there because you can hand this off to a bunch of accountants and see if they can pull off the same thing, and they may. But as designers, we have a very interesting set of tools to use. We can be creative, we can be thoughtful, we can expand and do things that most people don't think about. And that's an important part of today. Um, basically, it looks like this. So, so feasibility, technological feasibility. Now, I used to work at a company that, that would spend a lot of time on, can we make that? Can we make it? Is it, is it possible? And sometimes in science and research, that happens. Can we make that? But nobody asks, do people need it? Sometimes that, that goes by. Viability is about business. Is it sustainable? Is, can, can we make money from it? And it's not about being greedy and making a lot of money. It's can we sustain what we've made? Is it viable in the marketplace? Will it live for a while? But most importantly, when the, the design thinking kind of matrix, desirability. Do people actually need what you're making? Because if they don't, then why are you making it? So part of it is thinking about where innovation starts in the middle of this but you actually start the process with people. Now, part of the design process within IDEO and other places is about consumer research. Uh, I hate the word consumer, it's just research, it's understanding people. And today, in the short time that we have, we don't have a lot of time to go out in the world and understand all the nuances that go along with this. But luckily, for the participants that are here, you've gone and visited the Children's Hospital. You've seen some things that have affected kids and parents and administrators and doctors. And we're gonna talk about that today, but this is where we're starting. For those of you who aren't a part of this area of the workshop, these guys went out to the Children's Hospital, what, two weeks, three weeks ago? To see it for themselves. I went on Monday uh, and, and Pekka gave me a good tour. You have to experience things. You can't just design from inside a little box and more importantly, talking to people, experiencing it for yourself. And we can't do that all today, but we have a start of that. So design thinking is not the answer, but it's a methodology. And it's one that's been used by IDEO for years and years, and many places have taken it on and are starting to use it. And it's become part of a lexicon of ideas. How do we actually approach a problem using a designer's toolkit? So how can design thinking actually help healthcare? I'll play you a video um, from one of our clients, Kaiser Permanente, which is a large uh, uh, health system in the United States. And they've actually created their own innovation system after some work with IDEO. Uh, and I'll let them explain what design thinking is in terms of healthcare. These, these things are going to be in action early on in the hospital. Why is design thinking so powerful? Because it gets to the heart of the thinking. So IDEO has been involved in doing design thinking projects and, and uh, participatory design, working with healthcare professionals to think about healthcare through the lens of design. So what, what can we do? Um, with what we've learned. And so, I, you know, I, I, I tap the collective knowledge of IDEO um, and I, I have some things to share about what we've learned about healthcare so far. Um, the first one is kind of an obvious one, but hospitals really aren't designed for experiences. They're designed for transactions. Of all the hospitals we work for and, and with, generally, when you walk in, you realize that you're there to get served and move on. And we need to figure out a way to actually make this more of an experience, actually make it something so that people have a certain emotional feeling about why they come in, why they're there, how they're serviced. Because with healthcare, one of the most important things is about the emotional response, because that actually, physically, can help you get better. One of the projects we did was this uh, hospital called Nemers in Orlando. Actually, Nemers is a very large hospital chain, but they asked IDEO to help them rethink this exact problem around children's care and how do we actually improve the experience and make it less transactional. And I'll talk about a couple of cases with them, but if you look up there, you see all the, the colored windows. In every room, for each child, they can change the color of their window to whatever they want. So from a distance, you know this hospital's different, and from inside, the kid has some control and can express himself through whatever color they want to have their room be. It's a small thing, but it's a very important thing. Other things that they did, that, to think about the experience, they, they introduced more people into the equation. So when you walk into a hospital, there's always somebody there to greet you, to take care of you, somebody who asks and answers your questions. They actually created a way for um, a smart team, like a, a team of doctors to come and meet with your patient. So for example, if you're sick and you're a kid, all the people that are gonna take care of you come and speak to you. 
so they know and you know who they are. They all have RFID bracelets, so at any point you can find them and know where they are to come to you. These kinds of thinking, it's not the technology necessarily. It's not, it's not that, you know, it can be fancy. It doesn't have to be. But the point is you're thinking about it from the kid's point of view. In this case, we actually looked at prototyping a new waiting area. And this is all built out of foam core with some furniture and some wood. But you can very quickly create some new ideas around what you want to build and test it out on people and let people try it. Prototyping is a big part of, of design thinking and, and design uh, at IDEO. One of the other projects we worked on was for a large pharmaceutical company in the U.S., or not pharmaceutical, uh, pharmacy, called Walgreens. They're based out of Chicago. And they asked us, how can we make the prescription exchange, the whole pharmaceutical exchange between a, a patient or customer with the pharmacist a little more human? And again, it goes back to who's there to talk to you about things? Who's there to kind of listen to you? So we created a new service system that um, enabled physicians to come out from behind that counter and interact with people and create a space that actually facilitated that. And we built this all out of, out of foam core. Uh, and it looks like this now. Rolled out to 11 cities uh, in the United States. And basically what this has done was given people more access to the doctors, more comfort around their health care, and something that doesn't feel like a transaction. And that's a really important point. Um, to what we're going to do for the next children's hospital here. Patients come with other people. Now back in the 1946, when, when this hospital was built, that might not have been a consideration. But the fact is, in Finland, as, as you mentioned, children have the right to have their parents with them every step of the way. So a lot of times, hospitals have tons of equipment, tons of stuff in the hallways. You see some, uh, some of the pictures, you guys will come up and look. There's no room for the actual patients. It's equipment. But they also come with their families, or their brothers and sisters, or their friends. So part of the Niemers work we did was to actually redesign the long stay room so that cancer patients or kids with uh, parents and, and their siblings can actually live together in a room that feels less like a hospital room and more like a family room or a bedroom. They can actually make it their own. And a lot of hospitals have taken this kind of idea and moved it forward. Other ways to look at family spaces, you know, when you think of waiting rooms, when you're waiting to, to see what the doctor's going to come out with and, and uh, uh, diagnose your child, like, something that actually has more care and comfort for the rest of the family is really important. So IDEO designed this with uh, Niemers to make it feel like a very comfortable space and one that is inviting, not a place that you have to wait for your number to be called and look up and hope for the best. So, the other part of it, the other side of it, it's not just about the patients. It's also about the healthcare professionals that work there. If you can't have a good working space, a working environment or process, you're not going to do good work. So healthcare professionals are people too, so we have to think about their needs. We did some work with Kaiser Permanente uh, in the United States, and you saw the video earlier of uh, the, the innovation team there. The idea here was that there's a, a hole in the service uh, journey where nurses oftentimes will change shifts. And when they change shifts, it feels like a black hole. They, they describe it as like a ghost town where the patient doesn't know who's taking care of them now. And the nurses don't know what's going on. The ones that come on shift need to have some kind of knowledge exchange. So that's what IDEO created. We created a system for them to exchange knowledge at shift changes involving the patient. So it's not just two nurses in a dark room swapping stories. They actually have a very public way of explaining what needs to get done how much needs to get done next, and the patient has a visibility into the care that they're getting. So thinking about it from a professional's point of view actually affects having better health care overall for the patient. Emotions are always involved when it comes to hospitals. And that's the thing with, that, you know, when I asked you what you think, when you think of the word hospital, when you think of going to hospital, what do you think of? Um, for me, it's the smell of hospitals. I always think of, my mother used to be a nurse, uh, and she was an OR nurse, and, and Every time I'd visit her, I think of the smell of, of how, you know, the bleach and the, the cleanser and the ways that it, it's got to feel clean, but at the same time, that smell stayed with me for the rest of my life about hospitals. And to me, that maybe that's something you could fix. Um, one thing we've done, uh, we worked with this uh, a group called um, St. Joseph's uh, Systems in the United States, and what they wanted to do was approach care not just from an emotional standpoint, but from a sacred standpoint. They're a large Catholic church system. And what they wanted to do was create sacred connections to people, right? Sacred encounters. And when we say sacred, we mean preserving 
emphasizing respecting the dignity of every single patient that walks through that door because they believe that everybody has you know, the right to feel like people, not just patients. So, for example, the nurses that come in, when you walk into uh, St. Joseph's, the nurses actually record not just who you are, but what you're wearing. So at the time when they need to come get you, they don't call your name. They just walk over to the person that's wearing the, the light pink blouse and ask you to come over. So it's a very like, dignified way of, of doing a waiting room. But other things that they've learned outside of healthcare, they looked at hos uh, hotels. Hotels have a way of actually bringing out different moments in the, in the journey when a person comes to the hotel. They call it scenography. They want to create a space, a moment. For those of you who are interior designers or architects, you know, scenography sets the stage for the emotions that you're going to feel. So they took scenography and turned that into what they call spotlighting and spotlighting moments in the journey of the patient. So for example, uh, bringing someone in the waiting room a blanket just because they looked cold, paying attention and spotlighting the care and the dignity you're giving to that person. Bringing extra pillows to somebody that's in a long care room. You know they need it, you're, you're their nurse, but bringing it and being aware of that. It's surprising that not everybody really thinks of it that way. So what we did was we created actually a guidebook on how to be more sensitive and how to spotlight your patients. How to bring emotion into it so that people can actually get better because they feel better about the place that they're staying. And the last point, especially for this uh, group, kids can use their imaginations. So we have, to, we have to inspire them to use their imaginations. There's nothing worse uh, than, than meeting a small person, a little human being, who has to go through chemotherapy, that has to go through things that even adults, for the most part, have a hard time going through. The advantage with children is that kids are optimistic. You know, uh, we were talking to the press conference the other day and I, you know, we asked how many people here love going to the hospital? How many people here like going to the hospital? I've met people who've actually mentioned that their kid loves going to the hospital <laughs> because there's some fun things there. Yes, you have to go through some things that are painful. Yes, you have to go through things that are maybe different or alien, but there's something in that experience that made them think, well, oh, that was kind of fun. Or, that made me feel good. I want to go back there. What are those things that we can create together that emphasize that feeling. Now what we did, I'll give you an example. This is not an IDEO project. This is something that was done by GE Healthcare and uh, really inspiring. Um, our founder, David Kelly, is including this in his next book, which just got released. It's called Creative Confidence. And um, it's a story of, a, of an MRI machine that was designed by GE Healthcare. Top of the line, high tech, bleeding edge technology, actually super, super well designed. The designer of it was so proud of it. But what they found out when they put it in the hospital was that 80% of young patients had to be sedated to use it. Because it's terrifying to go in an MRI machine when you're sitting there laying down, locked in with this loud rumbling and noise around you. It scared them. It really scared them. So, the GE healthcare team thought about it and they said, how can we make this an experience that kids would want to do? So they did this. They turned it into a space adventure. Now, you strap yourself into the space suit and get into the, the ship and then you get into the MRI machine and you can hear the spaceship roaring and going. That becomes an experience that kids want to do. They want, it's like a ride. So a very, very simple change of perception, but they did it. And they did this on, on other machines. They did it on CT scanners, like the CT scanner you can get in, it's a pirate ship. You got to avoid the pirates when you get into the noise of the battle and the, the, the water. And they also did one for a jungle cruise. So, this is a system, it's not a one-off. These guys thought about this systematically, and GE Healthcare has been very successful with this. But the key is making kids understand that yes, they're going through something that is difficult, but inspiring them in ways that maybe they don't pay that much attention to that part of it. They're thinking about things that they want to be happy about. I'll play a video for you. This, is, uh, this was done by uh, an advertising agency that recreated the chemotherapy experience. The first step in the fight against cancer is believing in the cure. I love that story. So, how do we inspire kids to use their imagination? They're already using their imaginations. Doing things that can actually inspire them is part of our goal today. Okay? So, how do we help in Helsinki with pediatric health care? So, you know, as I mentioned, this group has gone to the hospital that exists today. And part of it is understanding and, and kind of experiencing it for yourself. And, you know, for those of you who have not been to the hospital, this is what it looks like. 
For those of you who've never been a patient or uh, gone to the hospital, this is what it looks like. Now part of this is seeing the experience through the eyes of a child can be very interesting. Now not all kids will be able to explain what's going on, but if you yourself experienced it, try to see what's going on. Look at the cues, because most of you here have never been there. What's going on here? What are the questions that come to mind when I walk into the children's hospital today? Where do I start? Who, who do I talk to first? Where do I go? Hopefully my mom's with me, and uh, maybe she knows. <laughs> or maybe she doesn't. This is what we're going to talk about today. All of you have experienced parts of this, and we'll look at this again. But remember, when you're going and designing something or making something, try your best to experience it through the eyes of the people that have to experience it, the ones that are going, you're designing for, the ones that you're making this for. Because otherwise, you really won't know. And no, not everybody can be a cancer patient. Not everybody has to go through a traumatic thing. But gaining empathy is the first step in the design thinking process, and that's what you guys have done already. Okay? So when I look back and I, I walk away from the children's hospital, I look at a situation like this. Which, which, which way do I go in? There are two entrances. One's emergency and one's for the regular patients who come in and then they get routed to the right place, right? This is where you get routed. So I, I, I'm not, as a, as a person, well, it doesn't hurt, you know, if you speak Finnish, I'm sure. But like, as an English-speaking American, I, I wasn't quite sure what to do. This is the area that I go to when I have to sit down and I bring my child for emergency care. What if I have my whole family with me? Where, where do they sit? If I have a child that's in long-term care, we know that the room sometimes can you know, have two patients in one room. Well, then where do their families sit? Where does my family sit? How can we be more comfortable together? And it, it's not just even about um, the ways that people see patients, but also for the doctors. For example, how can the doctors work better together? This is a great example that Pekka showed us that when doctors are finished with a case, they'll actually, they have a station where they have to record all the things that they need to do, but they have that in the, in the, op, in the station, the operating room, but they prefer to be in this room together where they can actually bounce ideas off each other, verify what they saw. How can we make that better? And I was really inspired by this. And if you look at one of the doors of the children's hospital, it looks like this. But then next door, the kids did this. So how can this place feel more like home? There's some very simple design things that we can create to make this feel more like home. So this is the process. And this is what we're going to do today. And for anybody who's just watching this and, and not participating in this particular one, this is basically the steps. Anybody can do this. But it is a process. One, you're going to gain empathy through research. You're going to develop insights, meaning what are the things that you learned from that research that inspire you to come up with new things? Maybe you didn't know them before. Ideation, brainstorming, creating, making, that's what you do after that. You create prototypes. Now, this process is not about making a thing and being finished with it. This process is about starting ideas, refining them, improving them, working with other people to make them better. And then you learn. And then you rinse, wash, and repeat. So, with research, one understands the user journey through the eyes of patients and staff. Insights are about identifying key elements and questions that we want to solve. Ideation is about imagining new concepts which can be taken further and design quickly, creating low fidelity prototypes. And not everybody is a designer, but everybody can use a pen and paper and draw stuff and make stuff and explain stuff. And that's what we're going to do later today. Don't expect that by the end of this, you're gonna have a shiny CAD rendering that will look awesome for the hospital to implement tomorrow. That is not the goal. The goal is to express what you're thinking. So today, it looks like this, and uh, we're gonna break you up into teams later, but through the day, we're gonna run through this process, and by the end of the day, at around five o'clock, you guys are going to present your ideas in five minutes. Five minutes sounds like a short time, but if you can't explain an idea in five minutes, it's too complicated. So this is what this, this kind of the, I don't have my little bell. I don't have the little bell from the, sorry. I used to have a bell, a tiny little bell you guys were going to laugh at me for to keep time, but uh, I don't have that today. So, let's begin. We're going to do something right now for everybody who's here, and then we'll take a short break. But you have to answer this question. When I think of going to hospital, I feel what? 
Does everybody back there have post-it notes and pens? If you guys can help me, we're going to distribute everybody in this room. I want you to write one thing. When I think of hospital, I think of what? I feel what? It could be anything. Grab some uh, paper and pens, and we're going to do this, and we're going to start the workshop in about five minutes. Okay? Thank you, everybody.